You are powerful, intelligent, assertive, ambitious, divinely created, a success in your own right. Yes, you. Me? <laughs> I'm Robin Ritchie, and this is Conversations in the Key of Black. And now I'd like to introduce to you your MC, your host for the night, your moderator, the executive producer of this event, and the visionary behind Conversations in the Key of Black, the lovely, the talented, the beautiful, Ms. Robin Ritchie. Hello, everyone. How are you? Look at your beautiful faces. It's so wonderful to see all of you. And hello to all of you, all of our virtual online viewers. Yes, I am Robin Ritchie, and it gives me great pleasure to be here with you. But before we begin, I would love for you to give a warm round of applause from your living rooms, okay, for the very beautiful Angie Delgado, as well as Alicia Smith, who are our social media correspondents. And with that said, we're going to get right to it as I introduce to you our illustrious panelists, um, very near and dear to my heart. Not only are they colleagues, but they are dear friends and I dare say family. And I will tell you that Conversations in the Key of Black, part one, and by the way, this is a three-part men's open forum as well as a celebration of black and brown fatherhood. So we want to make certain that not only do you tune in tonight at 7 p.m. where we'll be live streaming, but you will also be online to join us tomorrow, as well as the day, uh, which is Saturday, June 20th, when we conclude our three-part series. So with that said, it gives me great pleasure to begin to introduce to you our panel. I am going to begin with none other than corporate speaker extraordinaire, Mr. James Francis. How are you, dear? And by the way, for those of you who are watching, and let me just say this, you, you know I have a background of, of more than three decades in, in broadcast television and radio. So I've got to remind myself, work with me, family. I've got to remind myself to remind my panelists and my keynote, please unmute your mics, right? Yeah, James, how absolutely. are you there? <laughs> good evening, good evening. And thank you so much for having me, Robin. And welcome one and all for joining us. Um, as Robin mentioned, my name is James Francis. I am a corporate trainer and public speaker. My expertise is in the realms of diversity, inclusion, um, stress management, and effective communication. I'm born and raised a native son of the Bronx, New York, and uh, truly passionate about things, forms such as this, and the total climate in which we'll discuss tonight. So thank you guys so much. Thank you so very much. And he's very, very humbled. He is a world-renowned public speaker, ladies and gentlemen, I might add. Uh, next up, is none other than Mr. Jonathan C. Blassingame the third. Hi, how are you, Jonathan? I am well. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am Dr. Jonathan Blassingame. I'm a clinical psychologist at the McGovern Medical School at UT Health in Houston. Um, and my specialty is working with African Americans who tend to have psychotic disorders or more severe disorders like personality disorders or who are contemplating suicide. Um, and that's kind of my realm there. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Blassingame. Next up on the horizon is the very beautiful Lakeisha Dawkins. How are you? Please unmute your mic. Yes. Good evening, Robin. Thank you. Good evening, Robin, and good evening, panelists. Uh, my name is Lakeisha Dawkins, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a case doc. Um, my specialty is substance abuse and mental health. Um, I have a private practice located in New Rochelle. It's called Journey to Pathways. And um, my goal is to be um, an instrument for 
reach individuals who are searching for a safe space to be able to talk about a lot of the issues that have plagued them in their in their journey, especially with the the highlights of everything going on in our communities right now. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to have a fruitful conversation for, with everyone and also to be a resource. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And next we have a former NYPD police officer, none other than Mr. Todd Taylor. Hello, Todd. How are you? Please unmute your mic. How's everybody doing? My name is Todd Taylor, former NYPD police officer, currently soon to be retired court officer. I've been in law enforcement for over 30 years. Um, one of the founders of 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement, the Black Law Enforcement Alliance, where we go out and we teach children what to do when you stop by the police, what to do when you come to court, how to conduct yourself in the streets so you don't have to go through the police brutality and everything that's going on. Um, <clears throat> I also have a basketball program and, and a lot of things I do in the community. My goal is to break down the systemic racism that's going on throughout, uh, that's plaguing our police department and law enforcement. And that's why I'm here. I would love to talk about it. Thank you. Fantastic. And we're very happy to have you here. With that said, next up, Mr. Elder E. Cameron Foster. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, hey, how y'all doing? How you doing, Sister Robin? I am, as you said, L.D.E. Cameron Foster. I am an educator. I am an author. I am a proud member of the Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And I'm just a, a civil rights activist. I want to fight for the rights of the voiceless. And so I'm glad to be a part of this panel. And I hope the words that are disseminated here this evening will be a blessing to others and encouragement to all. Absolutely. Thank you so very, very much. Next up, we have none other than spoken word poet, author, a divine human being, such as all of them here, Mr. Josh Smalls. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And before I introduce to you our keynote, I'd also like to introduce to you our field correspondent on location coming to us, joining us from Minnesota, none other than Mr. Ryan Daniel. Ryan, please unmute your mic. Hi, dear, how are you? It's good night, hi everyone. I, uh, I am a business owner of an award-winning media production company here in Minnesota, and I am fortunate to be at Ground Zero. Uh, I was at the George Floyd Memorial again today. I just actually sent you some uh, some pictures there. And uh, it's very interesting what's happening in the community, right? Very interesting what's happening in the community. So as we chat here tonight, I'd love to share some of what the pastors are saying, some of what the ministry is actually saying, and what the media isn't saying. Absolutely. And that's why you've joined us, and we are blessed to have you here as well. And last but not least are... Keynote for tonight, none other than Reverend Dr. J. Lauren Russell. Welcome. Good oh, good evening, and thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I am so delighted to have been invited. I'm looking forward to this panel discussion. And um, yes, I'm going to make it real simple. My goal and my objective is to help people work out their soul salvation and to improve their walk in life. That's Absolutely. Real. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with that said, if you would be so kind, let's open the floor. And for those of you just joining us, you are logged on to Conversations in the Key of Black. I am Robin Ritchie, your host. And tonight, part one, this is part one of a three-part series that we have dedicated to Black and Brown men everywhere. This is a and an, an immense, immense open forum. When I tell you to be perfectly honest with you and to be transparent, ladies and gentlemen, this is something that is so near and dear to my heart. I had actually planned to produce this a year ago. Um, and the date that I had selected was Saturday, June 20th for 2020. And it would have been a marvelous 
experience in the form of a men's conference with all the bells and whistles. Um, and then COVID-19 was unleashed upon the world and all plans were brought to a very abrupt halt. And with that said, um, I must say myself, ladies and gentlemen, that what, what persuaded me to move forward with this and to convert what I had planned to be a conference into this uh, virtual format was um, some of the most harrowing experiences that of which are in the headlines. One of the reasons why Mr. Daniel is here, we are all here. Um, I've shed a lot of tears in what I've been seeing. And I said, you know, I've got to bring together these brilliant minds and we've got to bring this to the forefront of discussion. Not live, right? But KP was asking me about. Um, we, you're actually on. Um, you're open. Your mic is open. So I just wanted to make mention of that to uh, someone who was just speaking. And also, ladies and gentlemen, because you know that I have a background that is uh, more than three decades in broadcast. This is a forum that I will tell you. I am, if it were not for these fantastic individuals who have held my hands throughout this entire process, really and truly. So um, moving forward, just so that you know, tonight we are focusing on race, perception, and truth. As we stand in the shadows of survival, that's what it feels like today. Um, I'd like to begin with you, our keynote, if you would set the tone for what you're feeling in terms of your work and, and what's happening today. Well, I thank you so much sure. for that introduction and for this opportunity. Tonight, I've been asked to set the stage, to draw an outline of the reason we are having conversations in the key of black. There has never been a better day for this conversation. The eve of Juneteenth, the day the news reached the slaves in Texas that they were free two years and six months after the fact. Also, it's the weekend that we celebrate fatherhood. It is vitally important that we have this long overdue dialogue where we continue to develop a cohesiveness among ourselves that brings about a unified movement with a common objective to dismantle racism from every system in our nation and in the world. Then we need to challenge our white counterparts, those who benefit from white privilege to stand up and speak out against systemic racism, even if it means that they must give up their privilege in order to end racism and create a system that meets the needs of our yet to be United States of America. Absolutely. Almost every day that we take, every, we, every day that we awake, we hear of yet another police civilian incident that results in a black person getting killed capriciously, arbitrarily, and unjustly. Rayshawn Brooks is now added to the long list of black people, black men who have been killed by an overreaction by a white police officer. Yes. I read the story and I watched the video clips. This man was not a clear or present danger to the officer or anyone in the community. In fact, Ray Shard failed the sobriety test, which nullifies his ability to be a threat. Yes. Shot down while running away, then kicked as he lay in his own blood. Officer Garrett Rolfe was fired and faces 11 charges, including felony murder. His partner, Officer Devin Brosnan, or Brosnan, right, is charged with aggravated assault and violating his oath, is turning state's evidence, and is a witness for the district attorney. Atlanta Police Chief Erica Shields resigned. I just shake my head. Yes. That's just as sobering, or what's just as sobering, is the statistical fact that 24% of all persons killed by police are Black, who represent just 13% of the U.S. population. That translates into Blacks being more than 2.5 times more likely as whites than to be, to be shot and killed by a police officer. Now, Absolutely. I share this because systemic racism is shouting louder than COVID-19, which threatens to kill over 200,000 people right here in the United States. 20% have been and will continue to be Black. Add that to the protests and the large gatherings of predominantly black, black and brown people demanding change, that percentage could significantly increase in our communities. Now, this sets the table for tonight's discussion. 
But let me also give all of our protesters a word of caution. Wear your masks and your gloves. Use your hand sanitizer. Wash your hands. Remove bag and wash your clothing as soon as you get home. Your efforts are invaluable, but they will be nullified if you're dead. I'm a minister of the gospel and passionately believe that our love for God and for one another can defeat any hate that has, can, or will present itself. God has a plan for our lives, a plan to unify and to prosper us as a people and as a nation. He has a plan to bless us with a much better and harmonious world. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We are standing in the shadow of survival, working to understand race, perception, and the truth. Now let's begin our conversation in the key of black. And by the way, I want you to know something. I love you, and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. I turn it back over to you, Rob. I love that, and I, I, I thank you so very much. And with that said, not that it's acceptable at any point in time, but how many of us, of how many of us would imagine that in 2020, we are still systematically experiencing what we have read about in the history books, what we could only imagine that our ancestors experienced, and now it's uh, at the forefront of not only our consciousness, but our, our existence. And I think of Gil Scott Heron when he said that uh, his song, which was simply that the revolution will not be televised. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, he was right about that because it's not televised. It's live streamed now. It's live streamed. He didn't live to see exactly how prophetic his words were. And we are living in a day and age where it's not even a matter of being fearful of being outside in the street. You could be fearful lying down to go to bed, to be at rest in the, the, the sanctitude of your own home. And so I thank you, Reverend Russell, for your illustrious and powerful words, because that's exactly what it is. I want to go to Ryan Daniel, who is in the heart of uh, Ground Zero, as you said, in Minnesota. And please tell us what is happening. Update us on the George Floyd experiences. I've been hearing a lot of people use that term. And... Please open your mic. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank so, you. So thank you for having me. It's a, it's, it's a shift, guys. Um, my son, 11-year uh, author, went down to the memorial, and he did a piece that says, we could be witnessing the end of systemic racism in America. OK? Um, the folks that are out there uh, protesting, some of us older folks really can't control what they're about, right? And what you're seeing is a, a, a season where people are fed up. In our state, we are, in essence, fed up. We, are, we're, we, we were called the Jim Crow of the North. Okay? So all racism was in housing and wealth. So Minnesota is the second worst state with regards to the wealth gap for, for diverse people. Yet still, within our two cities, there are over a million uh, diverse people from all over the world. We're one of the most diverse cities in America. Right. Okay. Um, so what's been happening uh, a couple of weeks ago, a pastor who lived at Ground Zero, where his family was at my home. And uh, there's a lot of KKK running around blowing up stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, some folks would say it's Antifa, etc. Just I had a call today. Um, uh, some KKK was chasing uh, a youth around the neighborhood and they had to apprehend uh, the guy. In the same time where you're seeing all of these lynchings, this Absolutely. is real that's going on. All of the burnings that you've seen when they're arresting people, these kids are from way south, completely you know, white spaces that have been coming down and have been burning things. 
uh, all of the barricades that's been built, etc. A lot of this stuff has been organized and planned. It seems as if uh, white supremacist chapters have been activated all across um, our country. Absolutely, full throttle. Full, actually, full, yes, yes. Actually, full yes. Um, it's it's like a free for all really and truly. And I would dare to say in, in some arenas, it, it, it really appears to be as if it's a call for an extension, uh, extinction. Um, Todd, I'd like to hear from you. What are your thoughts? Please unmute your mic. Having been a NYPD police officer. <clears throat> well, I was getting ready to chime in and, and ask to speak because I was getting a little uh, this systemic racism has been going on since two. this is 2020. Right? Understand, 2020. I remember when Clifford Glover was killed in 73. I was a little boy at 11, 12 going to Regal Park getting bust out and one of the first kids being bust out. And we didn't know what racism was. We had the white friends. We was all, it was all that. But then when he was killed, everything changed. So what's the, we started seeing that we couldn't be this, this, we was the smartest ones in the class. But the racism made, it, it, it taught us how to make it normal. It became a normalcy to us where we, we would see something going on. We would think that's all right. Until this day, with people are finally waking up and seeing that it's not all right. The reason things are changing now is because you have, a lot of white people protested with the black people. They were out there. They're running around the streets with us. And that's changing. Now they're saying to themselves, oh my God, wait a minute. We, <clears throat> they're out there running around. They're not looting. Those are only a chosen few that's looting. But that's what they want to make it like this. The, those are the bad ones, the looters. It's not about the looters. Here's the problem what I have with this systematic racism. These cops that's killing kids, that's killing people, <laughs> they was ready to do that before they was a cop. All they did was get a license. So when they go through psychological, they're given a pass. They're given a pass. You know, when I was a police officer and I went to become a court officer, they saw that I was a police officer. I got a pass. They didn't even, they didn't even give me a, they just said, oh, oh, you're a police officer. You can handle that. Just go ahead. But how many people go through that? You know, oh, my father's Charlie Palatano. Oh, go ahead. He's a good cop. And they let him go right through. That's the problem. The kids that come up are sons of cops. They feel they can do whatever they want. So they go out there and it's a joke. Who can, <laughs> and to me, it feels like it's a, it's a game. Like who can get a body? And that's what they're doing. Like if we don't care for our lives, they don't care either. So they take it. How many people got hung? Have you, you realized that a lot of people have been hung since this George Floyd thing? How many? He's got seven. Seven people been hung. So what they saying is like, hey, we declare we still here. If we're not going to kill you that way, we're going to get you some way. So we are getting hung now, lynched, lynched. It's 2020, right in Manhattan Park, Tyron Park in 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 Washington Heights. They found a body hung, deemed it a suicide. How does somebody climb up a tree, put a noose a noose around their neck, and then swing off it? It doesn't happen. This is terrible. And this is why I'm trying to fight um, a battle that has been going on for so long. And if we don't stand together and come together, we'll never be able to change anything that's going on. We could have a hundred forums. We could have a hundred forums. But as long as, if we don't go outside and when something's going on and you see something happening and if you don't put a stop to it, it'll continue. If, you have, if you're in a position where you can bring a brother or sister up in position, Bring them up. Don't look at them and say, oh, uh, I don't like her attitude. I don't like her hair. Oh, he think he is who he is. And, and, and turn them away. You can't do that. Sure. We have to stand together. And this is a time when we have to go to come together. I'm going through a big thing in the courts right now where I'm sure you saw the sergeant um, posted racist uh, things on, fa on Facebook. She's been doing it for years. Years. But everybody ahead of her protected her. They were, <laughs> they with her. So who's going to stop it? Oh, you know, chill out. You know, chill out for a moment. Hey, hey, you can't do that. You know, huh? 
change your name on Facebook. Don't do it. And they continue on. So now it's all coming out. So now times is changing. And if we don't stand together now, <laughs> this, this, this forum that you put, this beautiful thing that you put together, Robin, means nothing. We have to go out here and continue to push and fight each and every one. If you could wake somebody, wake one person up a day, we could. That's 360 people a year. We need to wake people up and say what's going on. If you see something that happened, if you see some wrongdoing by a cop to a kid, stop him. Help, let me help him. I got him. Right. You know it's wrong. Right. And yeah. not be fooled by the distractions. And that's all this was going being on. A lot of distraction going on. It's a lot of distraction going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Absolutely. George, George, George Floyd wasn't the first one. <laughs> and he's not going to be the last one. Right. But we don't want any more. And, and we need to say something and do something before it happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Reverend Russell, we're going to go to you. And then I want to hear from Elder Foster. Reverend Russell, do you have a response to that? Oh, I have a lot of them. But I'll reserve it. <laughs> Listen, there, there is a, what, what Brother Todd says is so correct. I do a lot of work with the police department. And uh, the culture in the police department is one that has to be dealt with from the top down. You're, when he talks about getting a pass, it's a major pass. And so, you know, there are, there are so many um, people who are there who have come into the, hey, let me give you a perfect example. This is probably even better. The, the individual, the psychiatrist that was responsible for doing the psychological evaluations for police officers coming into the precinct, coming into the police department, um, was arrested and charged with murdering her own husband. And she had kept it secret for a while. How do you kill your husband and nobody finds out? Because there's a, there's a, there's, there's a, there's, there's a, uh, a collective that protected her. Um, but this is the person that evaluated the psychological well-being of people to become police officers. Right. I, I mean, how, when I think about, and matter of fact, I told this, uh, Brother Todd, you might appreciate this. I had an opportunity to speak with Moynihan, and I do speak with him and the commissioners and, 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 and Commissioner Shea and, and, and many of the chiefs that are down in the department. And I told them specifically, I said, look, you need to, we need to systemically go into the police department at its upper level, at the academy level, and teach how to engage in community uh, interactions that is different than what you learn in the academy. Because if not, when they come out with, this, with the surface information that they get, and they get around the veterans, the veterans going to pull it out of them. So what I'm saying is simply this that in order to change, talking about the police department now, there, there's a, it's systemic. So it's in every system in our community, every system in America. It's that we talked about last night as we were preparing for this, how it exists in the educational system. It right. exists everywhere. There's no way you can go to get around it. It's everywhere. So with the police department specifically, they need that element at the highest levels, and I think they need to be reevaluated periodically in order to make sure that they still have what it takes to be police officers. I don't care if you're a captain. I don't care if you're an inspector. I don't care if you are a chief. I don't care if you are the commissioner or deputy commissioner. Everybody needs to be reevaluated over a period of time in order to make sure that they are still capable of doing the job and that those biases that they picked up along the way are not dominating their activities. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we're going to hear from Elder Foster and then Dr. Blassingame. What are your thoughts? Thank you, Thank you Robin. Um, one of the things that I, I thought about when Brother Todd was talking is, um, I used to, I have a great friend who's in Brooklyn North right now who's a chief. And he's talked to me on several occasions about uh, what's going on. And one of the things that he said to me was that those bad policemen, uh, as you said, were bad before they got the badge. But a lot of them are, are what were victims of high school bullies. And they were bullied along the way. And then when they got a badge, when they killing that black man, it's not necessarily that black man that they're killing, but that bully. They right. see that bully, somebody else is, is in their mental. So I, I agree also with 
uh, Pastor Russell, that there has to be evaluations. Just when you get to a certain level, you're wrapped in that blue shield or that blue silence. And it doesn't matter what your skin is on the outside, but for, there are some good cops. And I, I want to also do that. My mother worked for the New York Police Department. So she was out there on the front lines and she never did any of the things that were done. And, and it's, it's just a matter of us educating our young people and our, our young men, our black men, we are an endangered species. We're in the, the field of two pandemics. One we're familiar with, which is racism and we've learned to live with. And the other one is COVID-19, we're struggling with. And so with the racism, we have to learn to, to deal with it differently. We, 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 like you said, we do these conferences and we march, we got a lot of uh, miles on our Nikes and our, our shoes and sneakers. But then we give up after the martyr of the moment is, is ceased, but we get a charge. We never wait for conviction. Once there's a charge, we stop, we go sit down somewhere and we think we're satisfied, but we have to stay on now. And I think that uh, George Floyd was just the ember that strike the match to light the powder keg to blow things out of position. And I think we're all the way up now. In the words of Fat Joe, we're all the way up and we're gonna take it to the top. And I think there is no stopping us. You know, we've had enough. Like I told you, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Blassingame, would you say that, because, you know, really and truly, can someone tell me why we are the object of such mass destruction? Why, what, what is it about people of color? What is it about black people? What is it about brown people? that says to the world, we're not worthy of living. We're not worthy of being respected. Well, I, I, can, can you shed some light on that regarding the perception? And yeah, race? absolutely. Um, so as you all, we all are familiar with this idea that race is a social construct, right? So it was developed by white people to kind of like put people in these little categories of like who's superior, who's inferior. And so prior to our, journey to America, um, we were perceived, you know, different tribes were of color, we were all equal. But here, one of the things that in today's time, what we're seeing, it's, it's the reminder. So at some point, I believe that many of our oppressors believe that we should have been crushed, we should have died off because of all the stress, all the pain, the murder that we've gone through. But I think we to them are a constant reminder that we come from a different stock. We come from a stock of survival, perseverance, of resiliency. And I think for them, it shows that we're here to stay. And I think so a lot of times, like we remind them of past atrocities that they have to atone for. A lot of these people aren't ready for this conversation because again, it's rooted in a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of misplaced anger and so a lot of times we talk about white fragility but we kind of overskip white mediocrity right so a lot of the things that we do black magic black excellence we show we lead we teach we basically built this country we built egypt we built amazing civilizations prior to egypt so i think we showed them that we kind of are smart, kind of smarter than them, better than them, athletic than them. We are just better than them. We love harder than them. We, we love our community better than they do. We don't necessarily see a dollar over lives. And so I think it becomes a constant reminder that this group of people tends to be better than us. And so it's hard for them to reconcile and kind of live forward. But I do want to address Dr. Um, uh, Reverend Lawrence uh, Russell's uh, point about the psychological part. So the problem with the police psychological, it's, let me defense, it's not valid. So I come from a school of valid assessments. The tests that they give these officers aren't valid. So the MMPI, which is the Minnesota uh, Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which is used for assessment of personality traits, was revised for police departments and it's not valid it's not standard so those scores don't really mean anything so they pass on and a psychiatrist isn't necessarily trained in personality assessment so a lot of these people they skirt under because what they're taught is how to answer the questions on these assessments because these assessments they're not designed to check for bias it just checks for 
personality traits, such as aggression, depression, um, how susceptible a person is to become a hypochondriac, how a person may be, be psychotic in some instances, but it doesn't necessarily get to the root of what an officer's integrity looks like. So those assessments are completely invalid. And so, um, right. please Would you don't. agree with that, Claude? Would you agree with that having been in, in the, 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 the fire, so to speak, every day? Would you agree with what Dr. Blasting Games just said? Yes, I agree with him. But his, his I, I, I was, my mind, my, my brain is going all over the place right now. So, on, uh, on Blasting Game, he he spoke about. The problem is that they're so they're so afraid of us. We started civilization. We 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 built the pyramids in Egypt. This pisses them off. That we we are better people. We've done more. So what they can do by them being in control, they have to break us down. They have to kill us. They have to put themselves in the light with it. With it. So, so you look at Egypt, which was the start of civilization, so they say, but they'll tell you that everybody there was white, but it's in North Africa. They'll make the Ten Commandments and believe, and we have to believe that they were all white. There's no way. They'll tell you Jesus was white. There's no way. But, but show me, show me but they won't teach us this in school. They say Columbus discovered America, but when he got here, he said, how Indians? We were here already, somebody was here already. So that right there is, our, that's a problem right there. Sure. The other thing is when the um, gentleman, I think it was Foster was talking about the bullies, that they come here and they want to kill, they, you know, they see the black kid was bullying them in school. It goes beyond that. I right. work with officers that never interacted with a black person in their life. Now they come in here and we're the threat. They thinking we're one of the white on, on NCIS or, or law and order and stuff like that. That's how they see us. That's all they know. I had a white boy tell me the only black people he ever saw was on your MTV raps. That was it. Wow. In, two, in, in, 2000, in, in, in 1990s, you only saw MTV raps. He said, there was, no, there was no black people in my trailer park where I live. There was no... There was, I didn't see any at the mall because he lived so far on Long Island. There's nothing out there but fields and strawberries and stuff. He had no match. <laughs> he, he didn't see any black people out there. He said, right. <laughs> and it's a shame. It's a shame. Then to go to Lauren Russell when you're talking about training. For what? Why are they going to go training? You know why they not? Because they in position already. Why are they going to bring themselves down and, and show another and, and do something else? They're not going to help us. We're here. We're in position. We're doing our thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take position and teach and, and to teach how better I can uh, interact with a black person. Ha <laughs> ha It's no way. <laughs> no way. It's right. fine. Sister, it's Sister fine. Robin. I'm fine. Sister, Sister Robin, huh. I want to. I want to. Yes. I'm sorry this, for being so this, passionate at, at time. No, it's this great. is why we're hey. here. This is why this hey. is conversations uh. in the key of black. The, the power we the power that we have as people of color, we never have used it. <laughs> we do have power. It's not looting stores because while you looting uh, the shoe store for the red bottoms, they're going to the gun store to make a legal purchase because they believe there's a war coming. So we, we have the wrong philosophies in our mind. Black dollar is strength. 1921, that's all I got to say is 1921 when they burned down Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we were building too much strength. Black wealth was on the rise. They took us out. You not, how dare you make a plan to be independent, to be self-sufficient, and they don't like it. So it's not only the fear of our size or, or what they deem intimidating size and, and strength, but they fear the fact that we did create this world. Everything was birthed out of the motherland. And so we have to keep them under thumb. Most of the back, black, the white products that we purchase, when you look down on your feet, a young person's feet, Jordans, everything else comes out of a white industry. They won't buy black products because they think black products are less than or inferior. inferior. Yeah. Star, right. uh, from the Knicks, Starberry. Starberry, he had a pair of sneakers. They were $19.99. I got nine pairs. Didn't nobody else have a pair because they wasn't $400. They rather wait overnight outside to get a pair of $400 sneakers than to go to a pair of $19.99 sneakers. And he made it affordable for our community. And so we don't want handouts. So we have to understand our power is in our pocket. Not with these, but it's in our pocket and voting. 
if we have the same energy that we have to go and tear up Walmart on November 3rd, we can make the difference and educate ourselves. Know what your political officers can do. Absolutely. Can I, can Thank I you for that. that. Can I just yes. say something? That there's a couple of things. A, um, you know, those individuals who are rioting, who are looting, you know, those weren't people from the community, at least not to start it. What was happening is that they had these spotters, if you will, mm -hmm. and they literally were going into the different communities and positioning bricks, rocks, Molotov cocktails. They had cars that had bottles and, and, the, and gasoline that were there prior to the people arriving as instigators to promote the looting. So what happens is they began to do the looting and then they depended on the mob mentality to drive everybody else in those stores. It didn't start right. with people in the community. It was people outside of the community. I really need to mention that because uh, I actually was talking to a commanding officer and they told me, I, have the, I, can, I can read you the text that he sent me, but he said that they were able to stop because they found the bricks, they found the car that had the Molotov, that had the bottles and the rags and the gasoline, and they were able to stop them because they were coming there to destroy the community. They were right. not from the community. That's number one. Number two, um, you had said something about and um, uh, about giving up their privilege. You know, I think uh, Doc Blaster said something about that. They don't want to give it up. Uh, and no, no, that was that was Todd. Todd said that, right? And you're right. But in my in my opening remarks, I said that we need to challenge our white counterparts those who benefit from white privilege to stand up and to speak out against systemic racism, even Absolutely. if it means that they must give up their privilege in order to end racism and create a system that meets the needs of our yet to be United States of America. Because the truth of the matter is they will have to give up some of their privilege in order to make this world what it ought to be and this country in particular. So I'm saying that with passion because I really want to make sure that I, I emphasize the point that we must challenge our white brothers and sisters, the white churches, the white institutions, the white organizations, that they must stand up with us and say, you know what, right is right and wrong is and wrong. wrong. Is wrong. Period. So, so if it costs me something, I'm willing to give it up in order to be on the right side for a change. Right. And if you say you're my friend, if you say that you love me, as my pastor likes to say, Reverend Sears, he says, if you say you L-O-V-E and don't G-I-V-E, you just talk to mm. J-I-V-E. Right. Real quick, um, I just wanted to say, so... Um, One moment, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Blassengame, and then we will go to James Francis. There you are. So there was a comment that mm -hmm. about we're seeing, like, systemic racism kind of get dismantled. I disagree with that because I think throughout history, I think this is so important about us learning from history, right? So when systems of oppression, when they get recognized, they don't go away, they just simply transform. So we went from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration. So Absolutely. now mass incarceration has been identified. We're talking about it, we research, we know all of the ramifications of how it destroys black communities. So it's kind of like, this magic trick, right? So the magician wants you to focus what's happening here, but the real magic is happening behind the scenes. So I think what we're seeing now is just the magic trick. So what we, I think a practical like thing that we can do today is hold people accountable. So again, if Nike is saying that they're gonna do X, Y, and Z, we have to hold them accountable. If Amazon is doing this, we need to hold them accountable. But I think what we can do starting today is to heal ourselves. So I think, noticing where we have like so everybody's role in this protest is going to be very different so mine is in mental health and psychology others may be on the street some people are in education wherever it is but we have to do the work but i think one thing that i really want to stress is that we got to take care of ourselves we have to take care of our own well-being our own mental health in order for us to stay strong to continue fighting this fight so one of the things i would definitely encourage people to do is again is be an ear listen to people who want to talk to you about what the hell they're going through what is happening their anger their frustrations right and again we have to be listening to comprehend and not to just give them responses like get over it you'll be fine make it work no that's not how this works validating for instance like i hear you 
And don't use the word but, because if you use the word but, you invalidate everything you said before. So again, just be that person to offer your shoulder. And sometimes your response may just be your silence, but your presence, is, I think it may be very, very helpful. So that's it for me. And when you say silence, for those of you who are watching online, we don't mean the silence that signifies complacency. We're not talking about that. Um, so please be certain. Uh, Mr. Francis, what are your thoughts as a corporate trainer and world-renowned public speaker? Just to piggyback on all of you wonderful people that have spoken before and to really piggyback on you know what the doctor just mentioned about listening. I teach people how to listen and how to actively listen, right? And there's a very big difference when you actively listen to someone and you show you're genuinely interested in his or her well-being. And that's the portion of people do not do on the most part. And for me, as I mentioned yesterday, as a corporate trainer, the last six, seven years, I've been blessed to speak to public school systems in New York City, down in DC, in front of the US Senate and the FBI right? And everything in between. And what I have realized and what I've defined myself on is I am changing the perspective. I am changing how they see the people on this Zoom meeting. And let me tell you how. As someone mentioned earlier, all they see, all they ever knew, right? Mr. Taylor, all he ever knew was MTV raps. You know Jay-Z, you know LeBron. Meanwhile, the true black and brown people are within this group and culture, right? And that's not gonna be promoted. That is fine. I will do so. I will do so. Cause nearly over 600 presentations, I can tell you now, outside of BET, 98% of every group I speak to, the majority are white. And I love it. And I share my stories. I share all of our stories because I wanna see their reaction. How comfortable are you with me speaking about George Floyd? How comfortable are you asking you, what are your unconscious biases, right? I speak towards that. I say, well, are you biased? They look at me and they feel nervous. I said, I didn't ask you, were you racist? I said, are you biased? Let me give you an example. If all of us see a seven foot person walking through a door, what may we assume? This brother or sister should play basketball, exactly. Right? Exactly. That's not being racist. That's not being prejudiced. That's an unconscious bias that we all have. And I try to get others and white people to realize you have an unconscious bias. Right. Because the James Francis you see with a suit jacket now is not, you don't feel the same way about James Francis on a six train headed to a Knicks game. Talk, man. And that's the difference. And that's right. what I try to portray to everyone in which I speak to who are white or whoever, even some black people who have that misconception of themselves, okay? We're not excluded from that. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm not waiting for Ellen DeGeneres to give, to donate 10 million to United Negro College Front. Mm -hmm. I want receipts on my Facebook group. I want receipts from my friends and family members. If we can do an ice bucket challenge two years ago with a bunch of people pouring ice on themselves, I can start a challenge and go viral as we educate the young men and women of our own communities moving forward and see what difference that makes, right? And really that's just my continued passion with this. It really is. And I will continue to change the perception. 